Medicine practitioner. Hi, welcome back to the Chinese Medicine Podcast. It's my pleasure today to interview Glenn Bowman. Um, we've got some really great stuff to talk about. We're going to be talking about life purpose, um, finding your purpose, and particularly the character Ling. I'm Marie Hopkinson, and welcome to the Chinese Medicine Podcast. Today I'm interviewing Glenn Bowman, and he has got special interest in um, linguistics and understanding Chinese medicine. And actually, Glenn is a student, and um, that's how I got to know Glenn. And I've heard him talk about this topic before, and it was so intriguing to me. And I said, Glenn, when you've got time, you've got to come and talk about this on the podcast because there's lots of people listening that I'm sure that you're going to get something out of this, and I really want to hear it a second time around. And um, we want to talk talk in more detail. So the first time around, I only heard it maybe ten minutes. We had a ten minute time frame to to do a talk. And um, we've got a lot more time now to get into the topic. And we're going to talk about Ling, which is purpose. Mm-hmm. Am I well, correct well, enough? Yeah, well, uh, it's a, um, first of all, it's a character yeah. from um, an ancient Chinese character that means essentially spiritual or a spiritual essence, but also one's own sort of spiritual essence. And then that, in a sense, can be tied into one's. Um, purpose. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Well, before we get into that, because I'm super excited about, <laughs> about the topic, um, I want to ask you a little bit about how you got into Chinese medicine, how, because you're studying mm-hmm. Chinese medicine now, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Um, how, how many years into it are you? So I'm in third year now. Third year. So, wow, congratulations, yeah. you made it. <laughs> <laughs> you made it halfway, plus yeah. the halfway. Yeah, um, almost there. Yeah, okay. And so what made you want to study Chinese medicine? Well, um, <clears throat> it was a very long and winding path that actually led me to Chinese medicine. After finishing high school, I sort of had a rejection of all forms of um, formal study. So I sort of, I believed that I would never go to a university or anything like that just mm. because of my own, um, I guess, experiences with high school and things like that. So I didn't really want anything to do with it. And when I was 17, I left traveling and I basically traveled and lived around the world in different places for the next nine years or so. Um, At some point along the way, I, um, well, actually it could be said that uh, as I was traveling, it sort of, to begin with, it was um, to experience the world and sort of external experiences and events and traveling um, in strange places. But then it progressively became more and more an internal journey for me. Mm. And um, I became very interested in the Uh, I guess you could say spiritual or mystical or even magical side of life and existence and I was led fortunately enough to certain experiences along the way which really opened my mind um, to these types of things and then as that progressed um, when I was living in South America I had an interest in um, the indigenous medical systems of South America and a very influential person in my life who works in that field um, recommend that I actually study Chinese medicine and uh, to begin with I couldn't really understand why I didn't know anything mm-hmm. about Chinese medicine I had never experienced anything to do with Chinese medicine but then I intuitively decided to come home and study it mm. and um, it was when I came home and I was in that first sort of foundations of Chinese medicine class that my jaw dropped and I realized this mm. was almost like a customized career path yeah. um, for me so yeah. I was very fortunate um, so you'd never had acupuncture before you studied it? Nothing. I knew, had you used uh, herb, like Chinese, particularly Chinese herbs or Chinese Nothing. Herbs? Yeah. I knew nothing about it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, I, I, I don't find that as strange as some people find yeah. because that's how I did it as well. Mm. Like I, I did it, no, I didn't have an 11 year journey <laughs> to yeah. discover it. I just went straight from high school to yeah. into it. But I also had that aha moment in that first lecture going, yeah. fuck, this is exactly what I want. Is exactly what I want to do. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's great. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, the, the, the universe or whatever has led you yeah. to the path. Yes, uh, I would, I feel yeah. so. And um, maybe that's what we're going to talk about today. How did you get, how did, how did you get to that path? <laughs> like, is that, um, yeah, maybe that's what we're going to unpack. Yeah, I think, because I think it actually ties in perfectly with what uh, we're, I guess, going to talk about. Mm-hmm. And as I see it, this character Ling and, mm-hmm. and what I was presenting in that speech in a class Um, and this is also why I have such a particular interest because I've been through my own sort of uh, confusion as to my who I am Mm. what my purpose is in life what is 
if any, my, my life purpose. And um, I think also, just sorry to interrupt sorry. you there, but it's something that um, our culture in a Western sense, like the English language, mm. doesn't encompass this understanding, like, like I'm getting excited about what you're talking about today, but it doesn't encompass that understanding of mm. that. Whereas you can, when you unpack the Chinese language, you can mm. see that it's embedded into the language to discover something like that, right? Absolutely. Yeah, let's get yeah, into it. Sure. Okay, <laughs> yeah. sure. So, where do we begin? Should I talk about the character first of all? Or? Yeah, let's do that. So, well, this is my, um, quite, I apologize to all the... Um, it's great. Look, he's, look how great his Chinese is. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a font. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. It's like Times Roman for <laughs> Chinese. <laughs> so, this is Ling. And so, basically, Chinese works as sort of like a language I'll of, pop this up of compounding. Okay. Thank you. Different... Um, I'll aim my uh, $2 today. <laughs> <laughs> different symbols and so up the top here we have yu which is means rain and then in the middle we have kou which means a mouth or an opening and then at the bottom we have wu which um, signifies dancing shamans and specifically um, female shamans so if we and this is the character for ling and this means ling, ling. l-i-n-g we'll put that at the bottom there so you can understand and this is a um, very ancient character and it's um, in there's a great dictionary, a classical Chinese dictionary in medieval Chinese by Paul Kroll, and he defines this word as uh, numinous, sacred, spiritual power or efficacy, life principle, vital principle, embodied realization of the numinous, one's inner spirit. Wow. Um, so essentially you could um, consider it as signifying the inherent magic intrinsic to life, uh, the inner mysterious and ultimately ineffable nature of all things. Um, spiritual nourishment and sustenance provided by heaven, and actually this might be a good opportunity to explain mm. why. So that we can think of this as a symbol. So here we have um, rain, and it's raining down into these open mouths, um, and we have the shamans at the bottom. So what this essentially, and um, I'm no sinologist, but a symbol is a symbol, so in one way we can just extract the meaning for our own selves. Mm. And so what I get out of this is that you have these female shamans, who female also signifies receptivity, so, and they're dancing. So it's a creative act, which is this um, born from the shaman, and the shaman's role throughout um, history has been to provide these sort of creative acts, whether it be through dancing or singing or, um, and music and these things. And yet it's with a sense of receptivity. And the... Um, producing this creative act which is um, uh, causing the rain to fall into these open mouths and so they're, all, they're um, through this creativity they're bringing sustenance from heaven heaven um, not uh, I've spoken to some people about heaven this mm. concept of heaven mm. in terms of Chinese medicine and things like that um, and in a Western culture especially in the English language we sometimes think of heaven as in the biblical sense, mm. but in this sense, heaven, we're referring to the heavens, to um, the sky, it could also be, and so then in, in Chinese, you have tian and tian, they both mean sky and, and heaven, and mm. this is actually the same in other languages, so you have in Spanish, mm. you have cielo, cielo means both mm. sky and heaven at the same time, and this is in many different languages, mm. but in English, we get mm. but anyway, so you're getting the sustenance of heaven, so this moisture of heaven is falling down, um, in response to this creative act, and it's um, uh, so I guess feeding or nourishing these um, open mouths so that that needed. It. Does yeah. that, that make sense? Yeah. So it's almost like this co-participatory relationship that the shaman or that a person can have with heaven in order to bring a greater good. In that sense. Yeah. Too. Right. Yeah. So everyone's benefiting from that rain, right? Not well, yes. just the shamans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Awesome. Good. Uh, and, um... Do we need this anymore? Oh, no, no, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. And so... I just have an interesting quote here from um, Lonnie Jarrett, who's a very inspiring uh, practitioner in the United States. And in his book, Nourishing Destiny, he says... Uh, an important part of the healing process often involves returning to our sense of potency empowered by the Ling spirit. It is essential to help patients experience themselves once again as effective forces in the world. An individual with a heart whose Ling spirit is unbalanced may be unsynchronized in all realms of life. 
Mm. So, yeah, so what I was essentially saying in that speech was that this patient was depressed and more than it just being sort of a stagnation of energy or anything like that, I sensed it was almost like this lack of his own sense of, you know, creativity and potency and purpose. Mm. And um, just for the viewers that don't know what he's talking about, <laughs> um, he gave a talk at um, college where that's how we, we come across this topic, um, where you were m making this about a, an actual patient, like how mm. you would apply this to a patient, right? That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, because people won't know what you mean by that speech. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Since they weren't there, <laughs> <Yes>. unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So you were applying this how how this applies to a, a patient, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So this is really great, and in theory, like it's it, it makes total sense. But what about um, like in an actual person, like a, a day to a day to day person that's struggling, like they've clicked on this video or listening to this podcast because they're like, yeah, I'd like to discover my purpose. Mm. Um, and how does this apply to them? Like, what does this mean? Do they need to dance around in the rain like a shaman? <laughs> Well, um, in a sense, yeah. Um, actually, it's interesting because um, when I originally presented this, and mm. I worked that back, but um, the it was about a, a patient um, who was experiencing some sort of depression, I guess. And what I felt from it was that um, rather than it just being merely, say, a stagnation of chi or anything mm. like that, it was actually a fundamental disconnection with the magic of mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. and this is very common I think yeah. in yeah. Uh, modern society especially yeah. here in the West because we tend to live um, we get we can get trapped in a very sort of mundane existence of living our day-to-day um, -day working life and um, so then that sort of sense of magic that is inherent within life itself um, gets sort of yeah. uh, blocked from view and this person had seem to have been disconnected from their, like Lonnie Jarrett says, their real potency and their, mm -hmm. their real efficacy in the world. So they didn't really believe in themselves, but also they'd sort of lost that sense of purpose and magic. Now, interestingly, when and we joke about becoming a dancing shaman, but interestingly, when this person went dancing, then they would feel much better. Yeah, wow. And so it was this actually dancing in this creative act, which awoke this sense of... Um, I guess, joy and um, positivity and purpose mm. in life. And then it was that act of going back to the sort of um, mundane existence and the frustrations of working, and they would get lost in that, and then that would... And so they, they would look for that um, weekly dance session yeah. to actually um, connect with those, I guess you could say, heavenly energies. Mm. So it's actually quite fitting for that character mm. in itself. Yeah, because yeah. I think one... I mean, I think that's... It's not a surprise to anyone watching this, I would, I would say, but um, it, it's so common now in our society that we work for money rather than working for because we want to do that thing. Um, I mean, maybe we started out, and I see lots of patients like this that started out in a job that they loved because they wanted to do it and they went into that career because they wanted to do it. And so there was a purpose and there was a desire for it. But then somewhere along the way, it just became this mundane, boring thing that they don't, they've lost connection with it and they don't want to do it anymore. But they can't get out of it because they don't want to lose their house or their, their car or they need to provide for their kids and their family. Mm. And it's a trap because mm. then they're like working or spending the majority of the time, um, you know, half the time sleeping, half the time um, working in this thing they hate and only living for what like a few hours a week or the weekend to enjoy and mm. and, and what do they do and they and yeah and, and it's like then the treatments that they do sort of don't cut it they might help a little bit so they do acupuncture they do herbs even western medicine you know like antidepressants or medications that people start taking and I'm not saying don't take those medications but they can help to a certain point mm. but then what where's that what's that what about that little gap mm. And maybe this is connecting, I'm going to connect with people about that little gap that, you know, is missing. That You could try everything physically till the cows come home, mm. but if you don't fix that issue, if you don't connect with your purpose, mm. then it's maybe what is it all for? Mm. Exactly. And it's, I've, I'm fascinated by the, um, the sort of the, the cosmology or the worldview that mm. we live in as a Western society that, like, as you said, to begin with, that we don't even have this idea w embedded in our language mm. as the Chinese do. And so this is very interesting because in terms of medicine, when you go to a GP, mostly people would think it would be absurd to say that, uh, for that GP to say, 
well, actually your medicine would be to connect with the magic of life because that's what's missing in your life. And so... <laughs> they probably would be struck off the wretched <laughs> stuff. Exactly. <laughs> Someone might report them for saying something like that, which is yeah. absurd, as you said. On yeah. one hand, yes, I can see how that that's absurd in the medical field. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, after listening to even a little bit of this, it seems like, well, isn't it absurd that you don't mention that? Mm, exactly. Yeah. And it's... Um, and it actually can be explained by how we view the world as a Western culture. And I'm very interested in, in, in these types of things. Mm. And I've um, learned a bit on a course from um, Rick Tarnas, who's a philosopher, psychologist um, from the United States. And he talks about um, the shift in worldviews. And this was very influential to my thinking. And also it ties in with Ling because... Previously, um, in a more in older time periods, human beings were, I, I, uh, I guess, embedded in the universe in a way in which they could. Um, nature was perceived to be ensouled, and so that uh, it wasn't just human beings that had a creative intelligence, but rather the entire, all of nature and all of the universe had this sort of inner potency and this creative um, intelligence, I guess you could say. And it was around the time of the so-called Enlightenment and the Copernican Revolution and all these things that we, uh, that that outer world became, they say, disenchanted. And so, and this has led to the current worldview in which basically consciousness is an epiphenomenon, they say, of matter and of material processes. And that only human beings really have this intelligence. And so Ling, that character coming from an ancient time period, sort of speaks to that um, and meaning, spiritual and even magical, sort of relates to that way in, in which um, all of nature is um, has a spiritual potency yeah, right. and that we can actually connect with that. And so I was thinking about it and it's interesting because if you were to look at a Chinese medical classic, Probably they would never say that if in this disorder, get them to connect with Ling. Mm. Because it didn't need to be said because the worldview in which they were living was a more magical, mythical worldview in which that was a given. They were, People they, already were. They already were inside that. Yeah. And so it's interesting, like if you look at the Shen Nong Ben Cao Jing, like an mm. old herbal classic, they'll, and you look at um, Longu, where this, the Longu was, where, where it was found, it says in um, on the banks of rivers and caves and grottoes where dragons have lived and died, mm. and they um, and s certain herbs will be used for ghosts and spectral entities, and this magical sort of thinking was within the Chinese culture for a very long yeah. time. Even Sun Simiao, in the sort of medieval times, um, would use incantations and almost like magical type. Um, so do you think they had, like, this is just me asking your opinion, I know you, none of us can go back to yeah. <laughs> those times, but um, in that Shen Nong Ben Tao Jing um, reference, do you think that they actually, there were dragons, there were big creatures that they called dragons there, or do you think they just had this mythical in, 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 thing that they thought that the dragons were there? Like, it was a uh, mythical dragon, yeah. or was it a real dragon, do you reckon? I'm not sure whether, whether it comes from... I just want to know. <laughs> it's, it's, got no, know to me, it's got no bearing on yeah. the to, to me, the To me, dragons are real, but not yeah. in a physical sense. They live in more of a mythic uh, yeah. um, part of the yeah, human yeah, consciousness, yeah. Yeah. which they were connected to. Yeah. And so then the dragon arises also. I mean, it's not a long, like it's distinct, I guess, but there is a dragon sort of um, creature that arises in the, in the West as well. Mm. And so there is this... Like, there must have been like, dragons archetypal. around. Like physical dragons at some point because they're so common in um, all cultures, like mentioned, right? right. They're mentioned in um, the Bible and stuff like that. Like, yeah. they, it, they must have, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> there must have been these giant dragon creatures that we've, that we've, that we've well, like dinosaurs. killed off. Yeah, exactly, like a, like a flying dinosaur. Yeah. Anyway, um, that's, a, <laughs> that's just a sidebar. That was mm. for free. Um, so, yeah, good. Okay, so people can connect with their, like, connecting with your purpose is important, right? Um, and so what, what do you think is, well, maybe you can give us an example from like the case that you presented, um, or like your, your, um, just, just so people don't, don't get misled or anything like Glenn's, um, 
what, third year's Chinese medicine student, so you, you, it's not like you're treating lots of patients <laughs> <laughs> with these theoretical ideas yet. Yes. Um, but you get to be... This yet, is all philosophy. And, um, <laughs> but it's really good, and I think um, one part about... Just going back to what you were saying before about um, that it was embedded into the culture and that's what didn't need to be mentioned. Yeah. Um, there's, there's been this... Um, push in Chinese medicine, especially in, in our country, in Australia, and there are lots of people watching this from the US or the UK, and it's very similar there as well, um, to, to westernise things, um, like what they call modernise things, um, and bring things into line with a more uh, scientific, a western scientific approach of um, how we talk about Chinese medicine, and there's nothing wrong with understanding things from different paradigms, I think, and using that paradigm, but I almost feel like um, the, the this paradigm of the linguistics and the understanding and the true nature of Chinese medicine is being lost amongst the um, need to show scientific proof mm. for what works because it's hard to... You could design a research trial where you've got people to discover their purpose and mm. see what happened, um, and, but it, it's probably much more in line with psychology than mm. what is in stock standard Chinese medicine. So even like you're saying it would be hard to... You, it, you'd be hard pressed to come to a doctor and for them to say, "Hey, you, you're feeling depressed. Have you have you thought about your purpose lately? Mm. <laughs> have you have you have you thought about you know, how's that going?" Um, but even a Chinese medicine practitioner probably won't go there mm. as a matter of um, just general conversation, right? Mm. Yes, and um, but I think it's a hugely important thing because I think um, part of our almost our evolution is modern human beings is to reconnect with what we have lost yeah yeah which is that understanding of the um intelligence of nature and mm -hmm. to be able to connect with nature in the sense that these shamans are connecting with the rain yeah. in that sense and to regain a bit of that notion that there is we are living within an ensouled universe and that things aren't just um dead inert yeah okay inert, so let's inert. talk about that a little bit more because maybe people are thinking yeah i'd like to reconnect with my purpose what do mm. i need to do mm. but how, how do they how do they connect how do they understand this interconnectedness of nature mm. well um actually it could be many different things that i remember I, I was listening to a actually an interview with lillian bridges who's a, a face reader and mm. a really wonderful woman it's by all sounds of it and she was talking about Ling, and she looked at someone, she had a patient, and she looked at him and she said, oh, you're Ling deficient, or something like this. Mm. And then he said, okay, and she, and she said her prescription for him was to go outside every day, lie on the grass, and just look at the clouds. Mm. And um, so, th and then just doing this, then, like, he went back a few weeks later, and he was feeling much better, and mm. he explained to her how much that he was feeling a, a real transformation. And now this may seem absurd to some people, but really it's the simple act of connecting with the magic of life that can be the greatest medicine mm. at times. Mm. So for this person, just lying down on the grass and looking at the clouds and reconnecting with that fundamental sense of awe and mystery and wonder at the fact that there are clouds existing at mm. all. And so this is something that is sort of inborn in us uh, when we're children and we can look at all things and we can see the magic in it. But as we grow and um, our um, priorities get diverted into education and these types of things, um, we, well, um, Lonnie Jarrett, based on the work of a Taoist um, uh, practitioner called um, Liu Yi Ming, uh, calls it sort of the mundane accretions. So yeah. when we're living, we build up these... Um, uh, accretions, I guess. What's yes. an accretion? Accretion, I like a, a, I, I, I think of it as sort of like a, a solidification. So this is okay. yin, yep. whereas our true nature, say, is yang. Yeah. So it's like like sediment building up. Exactly. On so something, exactly. Right? So it's yep. a sediment that is an influence of the the I guess the mundane material world. <laughs> sediment of the mundane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's, I'm sure lots of people can relate. To that. <laughs> it's like oh, just another day of sediment. Exactly. <laughs> Here we go again. It's so true. It's yeah. so true. And I think the reason why um, 
maybe people do think, oh, that's absurd. Like they go to a doctor and imagine being prescribed 10 minutes in the in nature. And yeah. I've seen some articles um, floating around. I'll see if I can post some up here. I'll put the link below of doctors in um, other, uh, it's more European countries I've seen doing that, prescribing people nature walks and stuff like mm. that as part of their treatment. Mm. Um, and there's been some research on these areas mm. um, because um, it's like, well, I could just, I could have just got that myself, but you're not. Like, mm. I could have just... I, I didn't come to you for sunshine and rainbows. Yeah. I came to you for medication. That Like, it's like the doctors are the gatekeepers to this stuff. Yeah. Um, whereas maybe they should be the facilitators. Or when I say doctors, I mean healthcare workers, including myself in those mm. things. Like, we should be the facilitators of this knowledge and, mm. this, and helping people to, uh, towards a path. It's not just necessarily, well, I need to sell you this medication. I need, mm. to, I need to give you something you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, and I think people, maybe they don't value it as much like the 10 minutes of sunshine or lying in the grass looking at the clouds because mm. they think well I could have just done that myself mm. exactly <laughs> well if you watch this podcast <laughs> you, might <be> <laughs> <laughs> you might be able to just do it yourself yeah yeah but yeah and it's interesting because that leads to almost like a redefinition of what the practitioner is and what they do because mm. really um, they should have the best interest of the the patient so whether that perhaps a patient needs weeks of acupuncture and herbs and yet another one might simply need like a to be you know led down a path yeah. that leads them just to looking at clouds for example yeah. or doing something of that nature yeah and look i think um p practitioners who do prescribe they let's say they don't prescribe the sunshine and rainbows and they just prescribe what they that's what they're doing the best they can with what they know mm -hmm. um and yeah okay maybe we could argue that they should know better and they could share, they could expand their consciousness and they could expand their ideas but um a lot of people are a lot of practitioners and doctors are doing it with the best they think they've got the patient's best oh, interest at heart yeah. yeah for sure i mean yeah always have the other side of the coin where people are you know doing it for money <laughs> and trying to sell yeah. you sell you sell, sell you something um but yeah let's not get into <laughs> A debate about the pharmaceutical industry on this no. today. Let's keep, let's keep it nice. Nor am I anyone to talk because I'm not even a practitioner. So. <laughs> That's all right. But when yeah. you when you are, you'll get yeah. your fair share of comeuppance. I'm yeah. sure <laughs> you get your backlash. Um, anyway, so yeah, so okay, people can connect with nature in some way. So it might be something that they might seem insignificant. Mm. This is what I'm picking up from what you're saying. It might mm. seem just like a little thing. But it, it is actually going to give you big returns if you're actually engaging mm. in doing it and you're. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think um, if we say take that the character again as a symbol of what mm. it means, so we have the, the the creative act of the shamans that are dancing. So there's lots of um, applications for this, right? Like it's not just dancing around or looking at clouds in, mm. in, in you know to connect with nature. What what else do you reckon this um, like character could be implying in that creativity? the shaman's dancing yeah well this is where i think the creativity and the symbol of the shaman also ties in with actually what you're saying before about one's life purpose so acting out in the world creatively what one essentially is and so if we think about a shaman their role as in in especially in ancient days was to sort of summon the rain and to do those rain dances and mm. this is um, sort of I guess universal for shamans around the world so they had this creative act which expressed itself through dancing and it had the effect on nature but whether we're a shaman or not and 99.9% .9 of us are not then we um, we all have a creative act that can have a response from life itself and also comes about to benefit the others just mm. as they were bringing down the rain to sort of feed the, the community or the yeah. tribe and um, to help the earth to grow so we can also have that and so I personally believe and it might not be the easiest thing to find and myself I took a long time to actually find it but we certainly um, have our own unique um, uh, gift to bring into the world and it could be through cooking it could be through music it could mm. be through writing it could be through um, coordinating groups it could be through public communication it could be through gardening it could be through anything but when we take that as the dance of the shaman as a creative act and we put our spirit into that then we find our place in the world mm. and and then that way we're actually serving our community and serving life itself just as um, you can think of like a a cell in the body might be a blood cell and mm. its purpose is to be an individual blood cell but also to 
serve the common good of the organism mm -hmm. of the body. Yeah. So when we think, consider ourselves as a um, organism of our family, of our culture, of, of the human race and of earth as a whole, then we can um, feel much more fulfilled and we can creatively mm. um, act out our purpose. If that yeah. makes sense. It does make, it makes total sense, yeah, yeah. for sure. I can't help but think, um, like I think about this a lot, like in our society, thinking about back when you talk about worldviews and stuff, how like most most people watching this are probably in dredged and entrenched in um, a capitalist society. And even to the point where, and I'm not having a go at these situations because that's just how we've got to things, but even to the point where like people get paid to care for a loved one. Um, and if, if that's you, you're getting paid to care for a loved one, I'm not having a go at you or um, it's just a comment, I guess, on where we've, how we've become everything is so monet monetized mm. everything is so monetary val and that is that seems to be the value that we or if we don't get that monetary value from something we mm. tend to not do it or we not we don't associate things maybe i put it another way like things that you don't get a monetary return from you tend to think of them as failures or mm. not as you don't associate them with a benefit mm. um whereas our society actually if you look at how how well i know in australia there's a lot of um things that are basically running in the background on the power of volunteers, right? right? Mm -hmm. those, there's no money involved in paying those people for their time. I mean, you might you, everything takes money. So I'm not saying let's not have any money because we, 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 we need money. But it's just something to think about, I think, in terms of like how do we get to this point where everything is so valued. And, and it, so I guess what I'm saying is I see a lot of people in the arts as well that they struggle to sort of see the benefit of their art their creative art because it doesn't have a monetary value mm. and the the capitalist in me says well that means your art isn't very valuable then it's not very successful it's terrible because no one wants to buy it mm. but on the, the other hand the artist in me says well you should still do it and the the practitioner in me says that's it's a if you get that benefit if that is your link if that is your creative purpose and you're you're meant to be doing that you should be doing it no matter whether you get money or not get mm. money from it um and then the cycle continues you know, and mm. the capitalist in me says it well if if you are meant to be doing it then mm. you would be good at it and then you get yeah. money from it mm. yeah. and so maybe just not doing it long enough for you to monetize it or you might mm. not be good at the business side of it to get the money from it to mm. make it to make like i'm talking about people that want to make their creative pursuit their living mm. they want to be and they don't necessarily want to you know have a million dollar mansion and be you know, like a hip hop star, big car. Mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> with, the, with the cash gun. <laughs> like they just want to make, they just don't want to have to work in their in their nine to five job anymore. They'd like to be able to monetize their art and their or their creative pursuit, let's say whatever it is, so that they don't have to do that mundane thing. Yeah, mm. it's just I, I don't know. It's a conundrum. <laughs> It is a conundrum, yeah, and it's a, and a difficult thing because it's not about just um, abandoning your day job to go look at clouds, but um, it's sort of finding yeah. the balance and accepting the reality that we currently live in this situation, mm. and so then I will, you know, do what I need to do within that, but at the same time finding the space and the time to devote to your own creativity mm. or to connecting with life in a, in a deeper sense. And yeah. so that actually when that happens, you can then give to whatever it is, whatever job you may be, even if it's something that you don't particularly want to be working. If you can have that connection with something greater, which is that sort of, I guess, spiritual connection with yourself and with life, then even that fills the most mundane of tasks with a sense of wonder and purpose. Yeah. And so you can give uh, fully to that. But if you're fully and completely just embedded in the um, encrustations or whatever you said of the of that um, <laughs> sediments sediments of sediments that of, of of life, then it's yeah. difficult to to uh, yeah to, yeah, to see yeah. through that and, and find the wonder in it and yeah, to see the so yeah. It's like having a, a glass that's you know it is crusty and it's all sedimenty. It takes time to clean it. You've mm. got to like soak it in something to get the you know, get mm. the crustaceans off it to get yeah. all that sediment off it. But then once it's clear, you can see through that glass, you know, two two layers of glass, you can see really clearly through mm. it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take much to keep it clean and to keep mm. it clear. 
Mm-hmm. So I guess that's maybe where a practitioner would come in and might it might be a Chinese herbalist or an acupuncturist. Mm-hmm. It might be another, maybe even psychology or some other mm-hmm. practitioners that would be able to help you get your glass clear again and get rid mm. of some of that sediment work out. I think psychology would probably be one of the better places you could go to or a practitioner that has a decent understanding of psychology. Mm. Also meditation. There mm. are some really great meditation courses. I personally practice um, Vipassana okay. and that's an excellent technique. Um, but And there are other many techniques um, that have been sort of devised and cultivated all around the world in spiritual traditions and things like that. But for sure I think like acupuncture, herbs and these types of things have that potential because if we think about sort of the channels and the organs as they can as they flow through us but then connect out into the world they mm. also they um they mediate our connection with external and internal life and reality so if so by um treating that we can actually assist the mm. the patient to yeah. have a deeper connection with themselves and with yeah. life also and in a yeah. very broad sense people that are sort of maybe not aware but acupuncture is the best at moving things around whereas herbs is probably the best at i mean it can still move things around it can still give you a good purge <laughs> that's what you say but it's really better at um putting substance in your body because it does you're taking a substance in you and it's helping you replenish and rebuild and so uh, when you go to see a practitioner i mean that's the difference between sort of i guess watching watching a podcast or or, or looking trying to do it yourself on google or something like that that a practitioner is going to be able to understand where you are at in this spectrum of things. Like, do you just need a little bit of a shift? Do you need a bit of a purge? Do you need, um, like, uh, just substance put in you to help you rebuild yourself? And if you've watched other videos I've done, like, talk about the five elements, wood, fire, earth, metal, water. And I would say this more relates to, like, the wood element of, of life in a way, right? So, like, because wood is about purpose and about doing new things and creativity and springtime and the five element cycle kind of lets us understand that like nothing's nothing's staying the same at any like you know you have five you have four seasons in a year um if you follow the chinese way they'd say five seasons um but that's another video (laughs) get into that but the 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 idea that okay nothing stays the same that's 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 something to to be thankful for i guess is that if you're going through a bad time nothing's going to stay in that it can't stay like that forever it's it's there, there will be a change coming and even if you're in a good a good season of life if you don't do the right things if you neglect to do the right things you'll you'll end up coming to a detriment um yeah so i don't want to get into another <laughs> I'm gonna hijack your thing with a different yeah. ramble um yeah. but the other thing you mentioned i think is really important i'd like to talk about that a bit more is was the um the mystery right because i think um again western society come um uh I was going to say communist then, <laughs> the opposite of that, capitalism, um, has kind of pushed us into this thing of like, we have to know everything, we have to mm. know how, and that I think that's one thing is why maybe in that, in that pursuit of knowing and that knowledge and needing to know and scientific validation for things, we, because we couldn't understand, there's lots of things now where, okay, so scientific understanding i'm not saying we throw that away but there's things like you mentioned meditation that's having a massive resurgence now Mm. mindfulness as well one is because our modern technology allows us to study the effects of it and so we can prove it and we can say oh look like i mean they've even done studies where they put people in an mri machine and made them look at trees Mm. right they're even looking at trees is you know and so that like it's like it confirms what we should why don't we one is why don't we just trust this ancient knowledge we need mm. well we need an mri machine to kind of confirm it now mm. it is nice to have that confirmation and to know that but at the same time that pursuit of knowing everything it's like you mentioned before about being a child mm. that wonder what do you think about that like how that's what how do, what do you think about how that's being lost do you think it's yeah well that's a very dear um topic to me actually because okay. i really loved being a yeah. child and i remember being like three or four and crying on my birthday and my mom said why are you crying and I said I don't want to be a year older I like staying the same age my mom said that's okay look at your father some men never grow up and so um, yeah, you but just there is... you remember that is pretty <laughs> precious <laughs> but um, so to me there was something extremely yeah precious about childhood and about imagination mm. and as I grew up and I continued to like to imagine things I personally found that I had to limit that and to restrict that and to stop the sense of play and imagination because then suddenly 
I had to conform to um, education, <laughs> to, to wearing a uniform, to standing in line, to doing, um, learning how to do division and learning how to spell my name, when really I just wanted to be um, playing in a world mm. of dinosaurs and these types of things. And so that which I consider to be my authentic nature and that sort of imagine, uh, living in that imaginary realm was, I guess, in a sense, deprived from mm. me and I had to conform to what society deemed like, to be Do you remember correct. being a child and thinking this is being deprived from me or is it something you look back on now and think... Um, no, something I look back on now, but I can, I still, <laughs> I can feel the sensation of what that meant for me at the time. Yeah. And so that uh, topic of childhood and maintaining that inner sense of child yeah. is um, one of my, I guess, passions yeah. in life. So how, how do people do that? People that are watching this now and they're thinking, yeah, that's me. Um, I feel like I, they, they feel very disconnected from that sense. What, mm. what would you suggest? What's worked for you? To reconnect with that. Well, what's worked with me <laughs> might not work for everybody because <laughs> it, okay. it took me a very long um, journey. But basically, for me, it was just a lot of self exploration and and lots of the way it manifested in my life was through traveling through lots of different countries, yeah. through meeting all different people, through very strange and outlandish experiences, and it was just a very I, I put a lot of intense um, effort into my own inner journey so, and I was living in isolated places in the, in the Amazon and um, in places yeah. like this and so eventually over time I, I came to this um, sort of uh, experience of myself and of life but also I, I managed to see that um, well, I don't know where I'm going with this but uh, I want to ask you another uh, question yeah. then how do you okay so you that's it's. I think that's amazing that you've done that, and if, and it, like you don't have to necessarily spend an eleven years journey, um, to do that. Was it eleven years? You said uh, about nine years. Sorry, yeah, nine years. Sorry. I've added on an extra two years every yeah, time. Okay. <laughs> um, you don't necessarily have to spend a massive amount of time doing it, yeah. and you can. I think you do. People should do what they what they can, and like yeah, the, maybe the ten yeah. minutes in the clouds is better than nothing at all, right? But, um, what about coming back to society, right? It mm. seems like you have. Um, you know, like you've been in school, let's say now for like three years, mm. um, and you have to conform in a way. Mm. Like you have to get money mm. um, <laughs> and and live. And do you find that now? Yeah, okay. Yes, you want, on one hand you're studying your um, your passion and you're following your life path. Mm. But do you find that there's a conflict there? Um, at times, but I think more than anything, uh, going to I guess to one extreme allowed me to then come back to an equilibrium so that when I come back into this, um, this the society which I used to previously reject, I can do it more willingly okay. and I can sort of see, uh, so what see do you through do, it in a sense. Okay, what do you do now? Let's say a couple of years you haven't been living in the Amazon or anything mm. like that. Have you? No. <laughs> that's I that's I where you go in the school holiday. I, I did go, <laughs> go back to that. Yeah, I did actually. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> it's probably, you're probably not going to be able to answer this question then. Yeah. Um, so what do you do if you feel that, that you're slipping away from that childlike wonder and the mystery? What mm. could people do in their day-to-day -day life that would help them reconnect with that? Do you just imagine yourself back in the Amazon? Like, what do you <laughs> No, um, personally, yeah. I find huge benefit in meditation. Yep. So I meditate... Um, couple of times a day. How long would you meditate for? Um, just about an hour a day. Like okay. just maybe just in a, one block or in one block. Okay. Yeah. But that I've done a, a quite a few um, quite a lot of meditation, so but even if it was five, ten mm. minutes or something like that. Okay. But People that want to get started in meditation mm. but never done it before, mm. what would they do? How would they get involved with that? Um, well, a lot of people, I think, they just use um, a guided meditation or something like that that you can download. But also, the way I learned was through these, um, they're called Vipassana, V-I-P-A-S-S-A-N-A -S -S -A courses. Mm -hmm. And they're all around the world, which okay. is excellent. So no matter essentially what yeah. continent we'll you're on. below for people to sort of mm. get more information. And so they're 10-day courses, but they're for if you really want to learn, because they're 10-day courses and you meditate 10 hours a day. Wow. It's in silence, you're not allowed to talk to anyone. I don't but, think I'd be able to. <laughs> yeah. But they give you food, they give you board, everything, and they give you the teaching. And so you can do these courses. Yep. So I've done it. Does anyone so <laughs> quit on day one? They're like, oh, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I was, when I was living in Venezuela, I was um, 
uh, assisting, so I was like um, volunteering yeah. To, yeah. to work for the cause. And on the yeah second morning, someone came up to me and he said, no, "This is not my bag. I'm leaving." <laughs> I so, can't hold it in anymore. Exactly. So yeah, but it's, it's not a for good, everyone. It's yeah. a good discipline, though. I think it's mm. it's it's good to try new mm. experiences, like you said, um, and be open. I think one of the things with the mystery is um, like trying to get away from I have to know everything about this exactly and I yeah. can just can some things just just can some things just be mystical mm. um, and I think the other one that I want to mention for people is like just there's such a pressure on people to use social media and to be and when you when you are actively a part of social media you tend to give away a lot of the mystery mm. so I might go to a barbecue with friends and family and mm. I know what's been going on everything there's nothing to talk about in a mm. way I mean mm. On one hand, it's good because you feel connected. So I'm not, it's another conundrum. <laughs> There's lots of conundrums in life. Um, you know, you feel connected because you've seen, oh, you've had a baby, you've done this, you've had this, blah, blah, blah. But on the other hand, there's no surprise. There's no mystery. I mean, there might be, maybe people don't put everything there. But I know some people, it seems like you'd be surprised if there was anything else <laughs> mm. <laughs> to put, to, to talk about that they haven't put on social exactly. media. Exactly. Yeah. So you know what type of pants they're wearing, what size they are, yeah. what the, the, new, the new shoes that they've yeah, got. Yeah. Even every like all troubles that have happened and good things and bad things. Yeah. I just think it's nice to have that mystery about people to Absolutely. have something to, Oh, yeah. there's something I want to get to know. Mm. like, there's something about you. I want to know more. I want to mm. kind of, and I think, yeah, it's a conundrum for me as a person that runs several businesses. Like, you want to, um, you, you, you need to put stuff out there because you want people to um, purchase your product or look at, you know, watch I'll, I'll watch the video, subscribe to the channel, that kind of stuff. But you, but you don't want to give everything away. And I think even in your business, you, you don't give everything away all at once, obviously, mm. because you need to keep people coming back to get more and more. And that's what, like, we are attracted to that mystery. We mm. want to know. Like, if I told a half a story now, people would be angry because mm. they want to know the ending. Like, where's the end of that story? Mm. Um, yeah, and I think that childlike mystery is something that we we need to get back in touch with more and more, right? Mm. Just that mystery. Absolutely. When I, um, something that really struck me when I was first in the jungle in the Amazon was the profound mystery of the place because mm. like you say we live in a society where we think we know about everything and we can very de in very minute detail explain the material world but we can't really say who we are why we're here and we don't really understand the inner dynamics mm. of our of our self and of life and but living in this world we tend to think that there is no sort of magic or anything like that or mystery so i remember being in the jungle and there it's just permeated by mystery because people talk to you completely seriously about um, what we would deem sort of mythical beings and, mm. and situations that come and so um, whether it be the pink dolphins of the of the rivers that can turn into human beings and how their uncle drowned because they were led into the water by one of these mythic one of these dolphins that turned into a human being and led them in there or these enormous snakes and these um, almost like imp-like spirits that um, people communicate with and things like that and so oh, wow. and they talk about it in such a serious way that you can't help but um, believe them and then I personally had some sort of mind-opening experiences of my own in relation to these types of things and so it just showed me that when you're in the heart of nature and in, in, in a sense there you're just surrounded by jungle by mm. trees by water and human beings no longer have this central place where they're surrounded by all of their own creations their buildings and and you're in the bosom of the mystery mm. and it permeates through and you no longer are sure mm. what life is and you kind of lose your solid footing a little yeah, bit okay. And it's interesting too because then when we, that's on an external level, but I personally think that we ourselves are very much like that once we get through our initial, so, and this is why meditation is so great, because when we dedicate ourselves to look inside and connect with what we really are, we start to move through the very structured sort of cities of our mind and our thoughts and our belief systems and then when we get into that sort of more unconscious level, mm. we find that actually we're that mysterious jungle that is full of darkness and strange creatures and all these things. Mm. And so that mystery, the, the most profound mystery lies within us. 
but most of the time we're dedicated to the outside world and so we're mm. not actually in tuning ourselves to to that yeah the that closest a lot of people us. get to that is like a dream like exactly. they have a weird dream and they can't get rid of the dream and they're just like or they might have a dream that recurs and if you talk to most psychologists they're like well that means something mm. um, that's your subconscious <laughs> trying to tell you <laughs> something and they and yeah we just ignore these signals mm. from inside even internally body signals we just fob off as oh well I must have eaten something bad that's why I feel that feeling like physical feelings can happen to our body because our our mind in Chinese medicine we think out as our shen is like trying to contact with us and trying to let us know right mm. and we don't really pay that much attention to it we just dismiss those things exactly and the dream is a really good point because the dream like we connect with that sort of magical aspect of ourselves every single day yeah, every night yeah. when we go to sleep mm. and yet if we have a profound experience in that then we'll wave it aside and say oh it's just a dream and yet when we are experiencing it it can actually seem more real mm. than when then yeah. when in a uh, waking life yeah well, it can be yeah. very like it leave you with a very lingering feeling mm. like you not you can't articulate it you can't verbalize it properly mm. but you've just got this feeling that you can't let go or something's ch- something's different and then you think oh that's just deja vu and you fob it off and go to get on with it get on with the day um yeah i think because it comes back to society what society values um again money like you can't really make money out of um you know s- some of these things that you, we, that, and then just in society we fob these things off as well they're not important um, yeah but they are important to us and I think um, it's been so valuable having this conversation having this chat and um, is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Um, no I think I just uh, personally like yeah. as we've established I'm not so experienced in, in practicing or anything but just through my own experiences and through my own connections with life, I've come to realize that um, this, what is I guess symbolized by Ling, is such a profound um, form of healing mm. and it, um, and it in a large part requires the act of the individual. So rather than, generally we think when we, we're sick then we can go to the doctor and they're going to treat us. But when it comes to this type of healing, it's a participatory thing. So we can go, mm. I guess, and we can get these treatments. But if we're not, um, I guess, putting our own work into it and our and yeah. our own intention into discovering this this mystery of ourselves and the magic of life and our own creative purpose, then I, I don't know if we'll mm. ever really get there. Yeah, well, you only get so far. You get to mm. a certain point, and that's where I see patients just um, keep, have to keep coming in for treatment. And I don't turn those people away, mm. but at the same time, as a practitioner, believe it or not, we don't want to you to have to keep coming in. We want mm. you to get better and be discharged and be be on your way at some point. Um, but it's like, yeah, there's some things like in Chinese medicine, they think of the cause of disease and one of those causes of disease is lifestyle. And one of the lifestyle causes of disease is like, like it is, it should be probably better articulated as this, like, I think this purpose, this thing should be part of it. But, um, when just to digress a tiny bit, but when the communists came in to, um, put their, flavor onto Chinese medicine. So around the 1950s when um, China, um, basically what happened with Chinese medicine is all the different kinds of systems of Chinese medicine were kind of accumulated into one traditional Chinese medicine. And that's what they made, they gave, did a lot of formalization of things. And one of the things they said in the in the stock standard, these are the causes of disease, one was work, gongzo, right? Mm. So work as in like, I think that when, the, when I first learned it in, back in as a 17 year old, um, I was like, oh yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, your work is your purpose, right? And it is, it is in a way, but I can see that now it's probably also a bit of a communist thing of like, hey, your work, your work is your purpose and you will make it your purpose because mm-hmm. we gave you that job. Um, but there is that your work as in what you do, you could take that to mean like what you do mm. and, and what you do in your day to day life. So like, it's what you do in your day-to-day life that if you can structure your life towards that being more purposeful and that being more what you are designed to do, you will feel more happiness. Mm. Um, and a great resource that I give my patients is with is from a, a psychologist called Martin Seligman. He formulated the happiness movement or the happiness kind of psychology. 
And he talks about discovering like your strengths and mm-hmm. then looking at your strengths. So for people that are watching this that are like at, at a level of like you feel like you're at rock bottom, you feel like you're so depressed, you don't feel like there's any inkling of any purpose there, that would be a very good place to start is you can go on to, I'll put the link below, it's called VIA Strengths. It's a free um, thing. I'm not affiliated or anything with them or like this isn't a paid promotion. It's just a, a resource that I use a lot. Um, and you can do this test for free and you can find out what your strengths are and then you can start from there and you can start to utilize the things that um, make like give you a sense of connection with what you're meant to be connecting with so like for instance it might be a, if it's appreciation of beauty and then the the way to go about that would be every day pick something a different way you could utilize appreciation of beauty so it might be lying on the ground and looking up at the clouds. It might be going outside and finding um, you know, some beautiful flowers or trees or something, or appreciating beauty, even going around your own house and finding five beautiful things. Um, whereas if that's not a strength for you, you might have been listening back before and you're like, oh, Murray, I'd never lie down and look at the clouds. Like That sounds like a waste of time. <laughs> because there might be something else that you're more wired for, mm-hmm. and that would be your ling, that would be your purpose, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. That would be your shaman dancing in to, to produce the rain, right? Mm-hmm. So. Um, not everyone's wired exactly the same and even Chinese medicine kind of recognises that mm. in, in, in other ways so fantastic, this has mm. been such a great talk I'm so, been so yeah. happy to do this um, yeah and so um, we'll put all the links below in the, des- in the description so if you want to um, find out any more information about what we've been talking about um, and so thank you so much Glenn for being on the, on the podcast and thank you very much for having me it's been an this. honour to be here Fantastic. All right. So if you're not a subscriber already and you like this content, then make sure you click the subscribe button below. Um, The other things you can do is if you're listening on iTunes or um, Spotify, then um, you can go on there and leave a review. That would really help to grow the channel. um, Yeah. So if you really like this content and you want to see more of it, make sure you click the like and the subscribe button. You can share the videos with your friends and family and I hope it's been useful and helpful to you. And um, we look forward to, well, I look forward to seeing you again. soon and um we might have glenn back on to talk about more stuff because he's a wealth of knowledge and um even though like actually i know some people with with more degrees that can't articulate as good as you can (laughs) articulate (laughs) um and so it's not about having a degree or having a being a practitioner that's qualified or anything I, i wanted you to talk today because you've got um you know, a wealth of knowledge and it's just that also that journey is important and so you i mean you could get tons of degrees but if you didn't put that, that nine years in, you wouldn't mm. be the same person, right? Mm, absolutely. Like, yeah. And, uh, yeah, if I could just share yeah, one last absolutely. thing. Yeah, it'd be that um, I, I, myself, I went sort of to one extreme, which is just, in a sense, just to pursue the mental, the psychic, the spiritual, mm. the, and all these types of things. And But ultimately, it was the biggest lesson was that true, if you want to say, spiritual, spirituality is to bring your findings of the internal into the external so that you actually participate in the greater whole of um, humanity and of and of the earth community I guess you could say mm. and so in a sense that there's a huge value and benefit say in um, staying in a cave and, and meditating say and being a complete ascetic but um, especially in this time of life, what we really need is for people to then share that amongst the community and to help other people. So um, in a sense, it's that moving towards a greater sense of wholeness, not just within oneself, but within the external. So then that sort of balances the, what they call the ascending and descending, or the internal and external, the individual with the collective. Mm. And so um, that was a big lesson for me, was that to return to the body, and this is such a blessing of Chinese medicine too, is that all of this is found in the body and to come to a um, tangible sense of um, of that magic rather than the escapist tendency to just yeah, um, that's a big be one. lost in yeah. the mind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the escapist, we could have another conversation yeah, about yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I know that quite yeah. well. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that, I mean, that, I think that's why people do the things that they do. Like they mm. get, we get trapped in these habits of doing stuff to escape the mm. fact that we don't have a purpose. I really like. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know Russell Brand's um, mm-hmm. stuff online. He's got he's got heaps of he's got this under the skin podcast as well, and it's a couple of other um, you know just just his just his stuff that he's been doing recently. It's very much in touch with that. And something you mentioned before we started, which we never talked about, was um, 
like why you think this is important now or why it's popular now is because there's is is it because there's just this massive need for it now? I think yeah, I think this is personally I find this really a fascinating thing. I think like if we look back, say in the Chinese medical text, most probably um, you're not going to find any prescription to connect with Ling because, as we spoke about, that was sort yeah. of a given. They were living. It's like if you can imagine a fish swimming in water; they're swimming already within that water. But since the time of the Enlightenment and the the sort of disenchantment of the cosmos, we all of that has been condensed within us, and now we look out on a material world in which there is no magic, yeah. and we've also lost that sort of a sense of purpose. Which is great because it's made us more um, individual, sort of autonomous beings. But I think for the evolution of our planet, if we are to survive with all mm. the current crisis in that, we need to connect w with nature itself, not yeah. just on a material level with statistics and all these things, which are hugely important, but connect with it on an internal level. And that um, involves like connecting with, uh, with what Ling, in a sense, represents. So... I was thinking about that the other day, that although you probably won't find it as a medicinal remedy in the past, it perhaps could be yeah, <laughs> in the present. Yeah, it needs to be prescribed <laughs> mm, now. And it needs to be prescribed, uh, in a sense, yeah. to the whole of humanity so that we can get through the current predicament that we're in. Yeah, yeah. And um, so that we can work with nature, just as the shamans are working with nature to, to do their creative act and to mm. be in sync with the movements of nature, with the rain, so that we can attune ourselves to nature, not just mm. on an external level of intellectual knowledge, but mm. actually on a deep level of finding the meaning within life, yeah. so that we can attune ourselves to the cosmos in that sense that we can live as one with mm. I think it's also, life. like, because of technology, it's allowed us not to be at the mercy of nature mm. anymore. Mm. And so, like, let's say, you know, because of electricity, for one, we don't have to, um, you know, turn the lights. We can have the lights on all night and be up all night if we want. Whereas if you didn't have electricity, you wouldn't be able to do all the things you can do. Mm. So we were, at one point, we were at the mercy and we've gone to this point of like, oh, now we can control nature in mm. a way. Like we can we can have ultimate control and do like air conditioning, right? You don't have to go, oh, it's so hot. And that's a whole other thing. I did a, a podcast uh, episode, just me talking the, um, a few weeks ago on that on that topic. That um, it's a, it's, it's, you've got to find the where you fit in that spectrum of being at the mercy of nature and controlling nature. And if mm. you if you control it to the point where you, you don't respect it anymore, you're not in tune with it anymore because you're like, right, um, I own this forest, I'm going to cut down all these trees mm. to make 100 tables and sell them, or whatever you're going to do with it. Like, that's, that's the one end of the spectrum versus the other end of the spectrum of, you know... Not yeah, having not nice. having a saw big enough mm. and a mill big enough to do that, which mm. is what we had before. We had, you know, we, mm. we just didn't have the technology to destroy nature as we mm. do now. Mm. But there's got to be a balance there, right? Somewhere in between there. Yeah, like an equilibrium between the yeah. two. And I think, um, yeah, and I think it's that same balance of connecting the inner with the external because and, and the, the move towards, um, you know, living in a physical reality with living in a sort of a more um, intangible reality mm. so that all of these things need to be combined and brought yeah. into balance. And like you said, now that there's such a movement towards people meditating or seeking out Chinese medicine and all these things seems to be a, um, a sign that human beings are searching for yeah. this, what, what has been lost. Yeah. And so, yeah. That's good. It starts with the searching. Yeah. So thank if thank thanks for thanks for searching and finding us here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we're, we're probably just going to leave it there today. Um, but yeah, we will have another chat about this stuff. So so it's so interesting. And if you like this content, you've got other questions, or you'd like um, Glenn to ask <laughs> answer your other questions. Why don't you put them in the comments below, and we'll have him back on again, and we'll chat about your other questions about your existential being <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and uh, your your life purpose and wing. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no it's problem. It's my pleasure. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you again on the next episode.